Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Laju. Welcome to another exciting live session of Avid Online. For those who are joining us for the first time, a special warm welcome to you. And please refer to the chat box for more information on Avid Learning and what we do, and also about our wonderful partners for this evening. We've completed six months six exciting months of online programming thus far since April this year when we first introduced our digital further learning campaign, Avid Online. Um, our social media platforms have been a buzz since then with a mix of live sessions like today and Avid Online videos. We've covered topics and issues from across the breadth of the arts and connected with our ever-growing online community with a wide range of local, national, and international speakers, truly bringing the best of around the world to your screens. And ensuring that even in these times, these very difficult times, we stay true to our mantra that learning never stops. Now we're in our seventh month, and we have curated and published almost 130 programs and counting. We're still going strong and we continue to spread the positivity of the arts to uplift, educate, and inspire our community. And this brings me to our evening session, which is part of Blurring Boundaries, a virtual month that aims to engage with emerging voices from the visual arts and established voices from design while examining the space, the various aspects and disciplines of the arts intersect. I hope you've caught some of the fascinating videos we've showcased on the subject so far. They are especially, we're showcasing our very own virtual art project that has brought six young cutting edge artists together to create exciting and innovative results. You can also check them out on a, a microsite that has been created for this whole project. And I think that link should be shared in the chat box shortly. And there's going to be a discussion next Thursday with the six artists. I also hope you caught our last week's session, which was on fantasy architecture with Mustan Dalvi, which was also part of our Blurring Boundaries series. Tonight, the Kalahura Association and Avid Learning present Blurring Boundaries, the Global Language of Design, a discussion on the culturally determined growth of a universal design language that spans across disciplines and borders. So a special, warm, virtual welcome to our powerhouse speakers for the evening, award-winning interior designer, Sunita Kohli, art connoisseur, textile revivist, and designer, Deepak Adwar, architect and academic, Dr. Smitha Dalvi, who will be in conversation with interior stylist and artistic curator, Srila Chatterjee. Welcome to all of you all. I think you can put their cameras on now, guys. For more about them, please refer to their very impressive bios that have been posted in the chat section. Uh, in today's session, some of these speakers will examine how design from textiles to monuments, from lettering to design objects, from colors to patterns, all have cultural lineages and linkages that have become globalized and come to speak a common tongue. Please note that this session will last 75 minutes, followed by a 15 minute Q&A in which Srila will be taking questions uh, submitted by the audiences. So do keep your questions um, coming, put them, uh, post them in the Q&A box throughout. And on that note, thank you once again for tuning in. I leave you in the very capable hands of our moderator, Srila. Look forward to a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Asad. Good evening, everybody. Um, we're talking today about the global language of design. We live in a world that has become smaller and smaller and shrunk with the explosion of technology. It's taken a pandemic to force most of us to learn how to live with our own micro worlds inside a room, a home, a neighborhood. Now, more than ever, the whole global village has become a familiar home and lines are blurred even as they are not always easy to cross. When you focus on design, what you're focusing on is creativity. I love what Maya Angelou said, you can't use up creativity. 
The more you use it, the more you have. It's this creativity that today has so many more influences, so many more winds blowing each of our ways. All this because it's easier to travel, there's an internet, and there's multiple kinds of media that blasts its way into our brains. For me, this is what blurs the lines. This is where language becomes less formal. And there's a global feeling that wraps around everything. I myself am not a fan of globalization. I prefer to acknowledge the global language that is available to tap and get more from. But in the end, real creativity comes from individual sparks. I would therefore pay homage to the global language that makes things possible, that makes things richer and more layered and allows many more people access. The greatest victory is when this language can help to enrich the most local dialect and put it on a universal stage for us all to enjoy. You can be literal about the language of design and trace the way familiar objects are called different names in different places. Take the Neel dye of India. It was traded with Europe as far back as the Greco-Roman Empire, but it stayed on, called Indicon in Greece, Indicum in Italy, and Indigo now in English. Where did this name come from? From the first real global highway, the Silk Route. As traders traveled, they learned about the source and they named the dye after the place it came from. Look at the language of design in architectural form. The revolutionary Art Deco movement swept Europe and the United States in the 20s and 30s, and by 1937 dominated the Ideal Home Exhibition in Bombay. 80 years later, the influence of that got Bombay a World Heritage Site status for an ensemble of buildings built at that time not in the style typical of Paris where it started, but an indigenous style often referred to as tropical deco. The lines blurred and a European movement has as one of its finest examples, a palace built in Jodhpur for Indian royalty with all the embellishments of their own tradition carved by master Rajasthani craftsmen, but with the new language of art deco. Perhaps the greatest outcome of any global language is that it encompasses a whole globe, the whole world. This means collaboration and the melding of culture. Political boundaries get forgotten as ideas and forms crisscross. And sometimes the origin gets forgotten as the new form takes over. This happens organically and political power can help the, man, can help the man-made boundaries break down for easier and faster spread. My favorite of these stories is Tipu Sultan, who so loved the crafts he discovered from Persia that he invited craftsmen to Mysore to introduce their skills and teach them locally. And thus was born the brilliant Chanapatna Lakma woodwork with its toys and now many other contemporary designs and the marquetry with real multicolored timbers that are astonishing and have evolved from the march of gods to anything a designer dreams of. Our panel today has three special people who've almost made it their mission to be blind to all these lines. They do what they do and they do it so well because they don't look for the boundaries they need to fit into. They let them get blurred so that a new thought emerges. I'm going to invite each of them to present a brief introduction of themselves and then we'll get into a discussion. We'll start with Smita Dalvi. Smita, over to you. Yeah. Are we still I hope everything is. You can hear me, right? We can hear you, right? We can't see your screen yet. All right, right. So uh, let let me begin by uh, thanking uh, Evid uh, for inviting me, and uh, thank you, Sila, for for this wonderful introduction to the panel. Uh, uh, I would talk about uh, the global language of design, uh, and uh, you know, talking of globalization of design, it is not a recent phenomenon. Throughout history, ideas in art and architecture have traveled across time, space, and culture. One area of my enduring interest and teaching has been Islamic art and aesthetics. And today I will use that to illustrate a few ideas uh, to drive across the concept of blurring boundaries. Uh, in Islamic art, uh, we see uh, several universal features transcending geographical boundaries. 
and abstract ornamentation is one of them it is thought to allude to an abstract divine uh, here what you see is a 10 pointed star derived from overlapping of two pentagons it is quite a ubiquitous pattern in islamic architecture uh, seen uh, right from india to middle east to spain moreover this pattern can occur at, on several scales from the tiniest of the objects to the underside of a dome on the other hand we can see islamic architecture and decorations assuming various different forms based on local geographies and uh, local building practices in which uh, they are situated we see a migration of ideas from one culture to another in in these several forms for example uh, here you see a calligraphic pattern found in dawa it is based on the mandala principle and what it does is that it repeats the names allah muhammad and ali in a seemingly endless pattern uh, uh, you know as a as a as a form of devotional uh, recitation uh, what you also see uh, uh, in several mosques in ahmedabad Uh, a stylized uh, sort of uh, of uh, form of decoration the sty a stylized vegetal form of decoration which is then framed in uh, temple like features resulting in a in a truly unique islamic decoration uh, uh, which is still abstract and uh, you you see this uh, in in mosques in ahmedabad and you you do not actually uh, see that uh, uh, you know it, it doesn't come from mughal architecture nor it comes from from persian architecture it is something that that evolves uh, through uh, you know a mixing of uh, of different influences and the craftsmen who are who are kind of uh, uh, you know uh, relying on their uh, uh, on their uh, time bound uh, you know age old traditions of craft uh, uh so therefore when we when we talk about decoration then there are techniques of decoration and we find an infusion uh, in the techniques of decoration by a even migration of artists from one region to another for example the florentine technique of pietra dura uh, arrived in the mughal court uh, while via the traveling uh, dwellers and what you see here uh is in delhi uh, red fort that you see uh, florentine uh, pieta dura panel side by side the ones crafted by the indian craftsmen uh and this technique of pieta dura later on also became popular in rajput architecture too and uh, uh, well the technique survives till today uh, there is a tendency to view religious practices and strangely even religious architecture uh, as water tight compartments in reality however the boundaries were quite porous resulting in several levels of syncretism and i will just show you uh, a couple of examples uh, so here we see uh, haveli uh, type uh, rajput temples uh, in jaipur uh, uh, which are inspired by forms of uh, mughal palace architecture and very curiously even the ornamentation uh, on these temples are abstract and non figural closer to home maratha architecture uh, you know is is influenced by uh, forms of both deccani architecture as well as mughal architecture uh, so there was uh, we see this level of uh, syncretism and uh, there are, there are several examples of that uh, uh, but at the same time uh, you know uh, when uh, when uh, the globalization is is not organic uh, but the the forces are actually uh, viewed as hegemonic uh, what we see is also a resistance to the idea of globalization for example in 20th century modernism uh, uh, you know and it is largely portrayed as uh, universal values represented by bauhaus of or international style Uh, but if we look closely uh, we find that uh, in in several places around the world there were other modernisms where the architects embraced no doubt the emancipatory values of modernism but they were also rooted in the 
in the culture of the land that they, they belong to. And these two are are my favorite examples: one from Iran and one from uh, from uh, from our own Habib Rahman in Delhi. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, conclude my presentation by saying that in today's time, globalization can be understood as shared histories that architects can learn from several histories today to derive their inspiration. And we can see that the ideas of Islamic architecture, such as abstraction, uh, uh, structural geometry, and stylized ornamentation, they continue to inspire architects around the world. So with this, uh, I end my presentation. Over to you, Sila. Thank you. That was lovely. Uh, Deepak, we're now ready for you. Good evening, everybody. First of all, thank you very much, Avid Learning. And uh, thank you, Srila Ji. And I would like to thank Gayatri Ji, who is not here, who put me on to this panel. So thanks a lot to all of you. And I will start. Dhani, can I have the presentation started, please? So uh, I work under my own name, Deepak Badhwar, and the global language of design. That's what I am talking about in my work. Thank you. Not only in design, innovation also comes in materials. So if something has been done traditionally in one material and you introduce something else, that's already globalization in a way. I am, can we go a little faster please? Thank you. So this is a little format I've made for my carpets and textiles. How in textiles we are using different materials from non-traditional to traditional and different motives of European, Mughal and Hindu elements. And in the carpets doing somebody's family crest, European flowers, modern motives and nature themes. I have been inspired by nature being a gardener and a botanist. So we created these unique lotus designs um, inspired by the lakes of Kashmir. I mean, Kashmir where I grew up has one of the most amazing lakes full of lotuses and kingfishers. So these carpets, the first one being a modern one, a more graphic one, to the absolute elaborate ones like painted, have been all designed keeping the lakes and keeping the lakes in mind, keeping the lakes of Kashmir in mind. And they are made in silk as well as Pashmina. Thank you. Whosoever has visited the Valley of Kashmir has been fascinated by the flowers and the birds there. This carpet has got a variety of flowers, including the saffron flower in the middle slide and special birds which are found in the valley, like the uh, paradise flycatcher and the hoopoe. Thank you. We got European roses and flowers to be woven in traditional carpets. So changing from the typical um, Islamic Indian form, we introduced a completely European style of roses. I'm sticking to flowers because they look beautiful and we are using strong colors which are very oriental, but we have suffused them with completely, uh, how should I say, European elements. A special carpet with the crest of a royal German family was commissioned a few years back. We got this crest woven and then balanced it very beautifully with flowers, which were European in character, and produced something which was more like a gobelin or a tapestry but it was a carpet for the floor. Pashmina carpets died out in Kashmir in the early 1900s. The peak was during Maharaja Ranjit Singh's time and before that by Jahangir. Pashmina being the finest wool, we are trying to revive this rather expensive art and the designs we are using are traditional partially 
but the first carpet you see on your screens that is using a totally Indian pattern, and the second one is the mille fleur, and the third one is the Mughal typical Mughal design, but all in Pashmina. Next, please. Same is with the shawls. Now these are pashmina and done with pure zari. Now that's an introduction of a material because zari was never used in Kani in Kashmir, but from Banaras we got in pure zari, made the Mughal buta, the European roses, as well as well the uh, ambi or kari. This design has evolved a lot from kari of Hindustan. It became Badam in the valley and went on to become a bote in Iran and eventually Paisley in Europe. So the same design, how it has crossed all boundaries and gone from here to the West, slowly but surely over the years. Today people say, is it a Paisley? I say, no, it's about a carry. It's a mango design. Uh, really? Yes, it is the same. It's something which has traveled. This is the use of the zari I was talking about. Pure Banaras zari woven into shawls in Kani, which is uh, again a sort of a blurring of a sari from Banaras to a Pashmina shawl from Kashmir, combining techniques and making something like this. Next please. This is revival of dyeing shawls with uh, pure saffron and natural dyes. And as you can see on the palette, there is zari and natural dyes in pure saffron. The Muga silk of Assam is well known in that region. It was the royal silk used only by royalty earlier. Today we have combined it with Pashmina to make a Muga and a Pashmina shawl, which is something unique and has not been done before. Of course, in material, we have crossed boundaries again. This is again, we are taking high altitude wool from Kashmir and Ladakh and combining it with hand spun natural dyed ahimsa silk or eri silk. And we are making stoles out of that. Everything is organic, it's completely natural dyed, it's ahimsa silk and good quality wool. Coming to miniature paintings, I work with Kangla artists and uh, we have tried to evolve the painting in a very contemporary style as well. Here we are showing the Bharat Mata, but uh, with submarines and uh, with uh, aircraft carriers with the China peeking in, the dragon peeking in through the side and India standing strong. Next please. The Last Supper, very famous, very famous. I was in Italy, I saw The Last Supper with Christ being blonde and all his apostles with blue eyes and blonde hair. So we just transported it to Kangra in the totally Indian style. It is The Last Supper, you can see by the clothes of Christ and his apostles, they're all simply dressed, not in the royal robes of Indian royalty, but have been placed in a very, very traditional style of Kangra painting with a peacock peeking in them from the top. Next please. For myself personally, for furniture, I got designed um, in Kerala, the Dasavatar, and it was combined together in Delhi in ebony wood with rosewood in Dasavatar, and another table in Shisham wood with the Ayatul Kursi inlaid in pure silver. This was done and commissioned in Jaipur. So as the globe shrinks, contemporary and modern designs have started to enrich our homes and surroundings. I truly believe the birth of new design does not mean the loss of tradition. We can have new designs keeping our traditions very much evolve, uh, alive and we can evolve and conserve. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, lovely Deepak, uh, lots to talk about. We'll move on to Sunita now. Hello, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's wonderful to meet my co-panelists who have never met in person, but I see that uh, 
we all seem to be speaking the same language. Of course, in different forms, we are in different but related disciplines. So I would like to say that uh, I would like to start that I've always believed that in our endings are our beginnings to quote T.S. Eliot in the Wasteland because I became a designer, um, a slow boat to China via a study of, uh, of English literature, both for my BA and my master's. And I have a Visharad, uh, uh, which is the equivalent of a BA in Indian classical uh, Hindustani music. So whatever that has to relate with design, this is me. So as I said in the beginning, I was born in Lahore. I was brought up in Lucknow. And that is a city that has fashioned me. And in Khajuraho is where, where I did one's first hotel for the Oberoi's. I don't have a photograph of that, but this is where I learned on the shop floor. Uh, in the next hotel that I had did for the Oberoi's, with a couple in between in Darjeeling, etc., was in Bhubaneswar. And that's where I started working. Uh, I knew that I only wanted to work with master craftsmen. I worked with Raghunath Mahapatra, who in 2015 had the distinction of being the first Thapati to get uh, Padma Vibhushan. And the way one has worked is just to go back, is uh, the floor pattern that you see is uh, from, the, uh, from a great temple in Bhubaneswar. And uh, I use the reflected ceiling plan to put it as a floor pattern in, in, um, and set in Tirazzo. And Tirazzo, I remember Mr. Uh, Mr. Obra was very keen that I use a red uh, Bangalore granite. And I said, no, I didn't wish to use it. He said, then you'll be responsible for the lobby. I said, no, I'm merely a designer. I cannot be responsible for a 7,000 square foot lobby. And then later on, as you go up the stairs, uh, that becomes part of that graphic plan. And this is again, uh, Maha, uh, this is Mahapatra. And I mean, these are all our master craftsmen. He's one of them. I work with them, whether it's in terracotta, in master weavers, in glass, in uh, as bronze makers from. So, and this is again using, uh, this is a contemporary house that one, did some years ago, I mean, my rather my daughter did, but I styled this part of it, is the entrance. And what you see is uh, a carved history of the life of Buddha. And uh, it's a frieze. And this is a very contemporary house because the flooring is Carlos Scarpa. And uh, I hope, uh, Asad, you are listening because I know you have a talk later on on, uh, on Carlos Scarpa later in the year. And all these things, because one is rooted as a designer in a very contemporary setting, the table is art deco and so are the chairs and so is the sideboard. And we've spoken about these before. And th these, this staircase becomes like, uh, like a sculpture in itself, totally contemporary. But as you will see, one is very rooted. This is another um, house that one did in 2004. And the entrance way to it are these small models in granite of uh, the tank temple at the great Lingaraj temple. And so, but this is used in a very contemporary way. There are bronze lotuses, which may not be very cl uh, clear here, done by Radha Krishnan. So one uses uh, many artists, many artisans, and many great uh, master craftsmen. Uh, this is the living room and the dining room of that space and the ceiling which is coffered one is gold gilded and the other silver gilded and below which is uh, hanging vinini chandeliers vinini being the best they make the best decorative lights in the world they're known for it and why did I choose to do gold and silver because to me that is a metaphor for Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb and it finds itself in gold and silver, whether it is being used in gilding like this, or it is being used um, in objects which, or in, in textiles. Um, and this again, this image one selected because in, in the forefront is a, Scarlo, uh, is a Carlos Scarpa plate. He's a, he's a designer I hugely admire. 
And this is again, as you see it in a pandan, it's called Ganga Jamni work because of, of course, there is the philosophy and then there are these material manifestations of this philosophy in the Indo-Gangetic plane, which all has to do with the syncretic culture, which we all understand and know. Uh, I was asked to quickly speak about my work. I'll go very, very fast. I've had the privilege of working in a few countries deeply. Uh, this is uh, the Mina House in Cairo. And um, this is all work that is uh, using the Paisley over there. First casino in Aswan, do, using pharaonic materials. Ella Rish uh, doing Bedouin work, uh, using Baladi glass. Then the first boat uh, that I did for the Oberoi's. And I particularly wanted to show this because we worked on gateway paper and pen. Nobody does that now. I mean, we researched through books and libraries. We traveled and saw, I mean, I have done a large part of my work in the pre-internet era. And so from those drawings, it would get translated into, uh, I mean, elevations. And then this is a suite on that boat. Uh, this is Tipu Sultan, which I absolutely loved. And you see the palette, you see the work, uh, and then it translates in our own work. And uh, because I think this is much to do also with racial memory. And uh, so you have, I've been a furniture manufacturer now for uh, close to almost 50 years. Bidamai, what I used to do in the 19. Uh, 80s and 90s and be the my today as we do from my own workshops and this is indigo we spoke about indigo indigo the way one uses it across and uh, uh, and this is indigo majorel and i went you know when i went to marrakesh i thought you know i mean right that's Yves Saint Laurent who said you cannot understand color unless you come to india and these are taken in marrakesh more indigo and Bhutan, with its Buddhist philosophy, has played a, a large part in my research. Um, this is the parliament building that one had designed. I quickly take you through this because, um, and I've done a lot of work in Delhi uh, on the work of Sir Edwin Lachins, and where I have used master weavers, master um, master craftsmen, and. Um, I will, when we speak about Pietra Dura work, this is our contemporary version of what we do with Pietra Dura. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, when we had our pre-discussions and now looking at the presentations again, I realized that so much of what becomes the defining language that identifies each of you is actually traced to uh, either cultural influences that go all the way back to upbringing and environment or to choices that were made at a point where you did it knowingly or you jumped into it and said, let's see where it goes. I was fascinated when I heard about them because it's easy to trace how that was the foundation for everything that's been built today. And I think it would be great to share a little of that. Um, Deepak, let's start with you. Uh, I remember your your telling us a little bit about how you two parts of your family did two completely different things. You come from a background of great carpet makers, carpet weavers on one side, and you had a grandfather who was a botanist, correct? Absolutely, yes. And, and a both, both of them obviously played a huge role in your life because you're looking at all these incredible carpets and they're like gardens. And then you're also a gardener, which you didn't show in your presentation. Yes. Well, I am a gardener. So please talk a little bit about it. How does this amazing mix live through you every day? This is actually very natural. I am making carpets and shawls depicting mainly nature, flowers, birds, and everything that's around me. I grew up in Srinagar and Kashmir. I studied there. I worked in a botanical nursery because my grandfather was a botanist and a nurseryman. Wandering in the mountains, looking at wild flowers, that has been the inspiration of so many things which I'm doing today. So my growing up years have today evolved into my design in carpets, shawls, even in paintings to a certain extent. 
and I design gardens as well because the botanical knowledge comes uh, very, very useful in that. You know, one thing I wondered is you do all these things and I can see how uh, you, you play in each one of them. But is the team that works with you, Your one team or do you have several teams, all of whom have different specializations? Sorry, can you hear me now? Now I hear you. Yes, please. Okay. I, I was just talking about the fact. Okay, I was talking about the fact that I wondered whether through all these various disciplines that you work with, yes. um, you're the common factor. But are your teams different? Do you have different they, teams they are going completely through the different. They are completely different. Because the people who are weaving my carpets, they have no botanical idea. Those who are doing my shawls, they also are just using the design aspect. And the people I work for in gardens, um, they are not mainly concerned by carpets or shawls. So they are uh, different people I'm your, working Your influence with. doesn't go into them. How, Sorry. how can it go? I mean, if I am designing a garden, I can hardly put a carpet bringing it to them. I mean, it will be just not practical. However, okay. while weaving my carpets or shawls, I do say, go and see Nishat Bagh, go and see Shalimar Bagh, because that's done in Srinagar. Yeah. Go and see what a beautiful heritage we have. And I'm trying to put all that into our uh, work. Thank you. Uh, Sunita, I, I wanted to ask you to expand a little bit about what you briefly went into when you talked about the Ganga Jamni Tazeeb. Can you explain it? Because you, you, when we talked, you said how much of that influenced what you became because you grew up like that. You grew up in a very secular Lucknow where food was an important thing that amalgamated lots of experiences and so did everything else. So talk about how that got into your practice. Well, today, you know, as you know, food is being recognized also by UNESCO as an integral part of intangible heritage. Mm -hmm. And we know uh, much as art and culture, cultural motifs also travel down the Silk Route. Yeah. So did food travel down? So I mean, we are today. We are today. We have intangible heritage, and we have tangible heritage in terms of our buildings, etc. But the way one grew up, you know, my mother, as I always said, that I'm in the autumn of my life, and I re I realize now what were my influences. My mother comes from Quetta, a Hindu from Quetta. And my father, a Rajput, but a Lahori. So Lahore was his first city for some generations. And incidentally, somebody spoke of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And it's interesting that my great-great-grandfather was Maharaja Ranjit Singh's historian. So these are all part of our, of our family histories. Uh, because ours is a very... <clears throat> I mean, I grew up in Lucknow. So uh, growing up in Lucknow, I think the, influ the way it influenced me was not only did my, were my parents liberal, secular, but being a Hindu, I grew up in a Muslim city because the elite of that city to date is Muslim. And I studied in a Roman Catholic convent. And I think all these, so, you know, when I'm in Europe, I, I have to attend mass if there's a great cathedral or a church or anything. Like I must go to a mosque if I'm in Istanbul and I must, I love touring all the great temples, but this is us. Yeah. And Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb is manifests itself. Actually, it's a thought process and it's a thought process which believes in syncretic culture, mm -hmm. true syncretic culture and respecting each other's diversities and respecting and accepting each other's diversities. I mean, your personal faith is your personal faith. Therefore, the way we grew up in Lucknow, all, all festivals were celebrated. And to date, all the Muslim butchers will not sell meat during the Navratris. And another great example I can give is of Asaf Dola, the fourth the, uh, the person who really built all the fine buildings in Lucknow, the fourth Nawab of Awadh. And he built the Bada Imam Bada, which is beautiful. And uh, of course, Dampukt and all that also comes from him. But most importantly, 
he is the one who donated the land for the Gorakhpur Mutt, where sits the present chief minister. So this was this was the secularity of those rulers, and it continued, uh, and it has continued, and it's very much a part of what Lucknow is, where there's such a celebration of of uh, of of a common way of life very much uh, this you know the same as saying blurred boundaries where there's nothing that belongs only to one little box but it's going everywhere and creating the whole which is the influence on you because culture night does not respect political boundaries yeah. culture is so yeah. you know all of us i i saw everybody's excellent presentation I mean, everybody's practice is crossing into and weaving in and out, however rooted we are in our own culture. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Sunita, one of the most interesting mm. things uh, I heard from you was that you didn't have like a life changing uh, thought that I'm going to be an architect. That's my dream. Architecture happened. And what you said was the most relevant thing was what have you done with it? And Clearly, you've done a lot with it and becoming, I, I understood that, you know, becoming part of the Indian aesthetics program really was the germ for everything that inspired you because of the introduction to art and aesthetics in so many ways. And then your, your journey from there. So talk a little about that because that was really interesting. Smita, your sound is off. So tell us how that exposure, op you know, opened your eyes, how you instantly loved the Islamic architecture that you were exposed to. Oh, well, uh, you know, uh, becoming a teacher of architecture was, I think, a, a turning point uh, in my life, you know, uh, from the thick, being in the thick of the practice. When I went into academia, I thought I would be perhaps be doing both. But very soon, uh, you know, I was, I was drawn in by... Uh, by academics, by, by research, by writing, by, by studying, you know, uh, in order to teach you to study. And one of the things uh, that I was teaching was history of, uh, of art and architecture. And uh, I have always been interested in history right from my school days, uh, through my architecture student days. And when I became a teacher of architecture, uh, and I, when, I, when I studied, uh, you know, uh, more deeply, uh, uh, history of uh, art and architecture. Uh, it was it was really a fascinating experience because that allowed me to see architecture as a discipline, you know, as a as a civilizational force rather than uh, you know just something that uh, something to build or something something to practice. So uh, that was uh, something important. And then, as you said, you know, Indian aesthetics happened, where uh, uh, some of us we we joined the Indian aesthetics program. Uh, you know, which Rashmi Poddar uh, had started in Mumbai University and uh, began even uh, teaching there. And one of the things I was uh, teaching for a for very long time over there was, uh, was Islamic aesthetics, Indo-Islamic aesthetics. And uh, both, uh, you know, uh, doing the course as well as teaching in it, again, kind of, uh, you know, uh, made, uh, made me aware of... Uh, uh, you know of all the cross connections you know in the in the world history and in, in indian history uh, how uh, ideas have traveled how ideas are similar how uh, ideas have transformed you know from while traveling from one to another and that uh, uh, you know uh, uh, since then has become uh, quite a theme of uh, of my studies my uh, my research my writing uh, I, I, I write quite a lot about uh, about syncretic uh, uh, ideas uh, in uh, in art and architecture, not just historic, but but also modern and and, and contemporary, uh, uh, etc. So uh, I think that is that is that was uh, some something like a mind opening uh, uh, thing to me, and you know, which gives me a great amount of joy. Uh, so that so this is one of the things that that I do, uh, you know, teaching Islamic aesthetics, among so many other things that that one needs to do no, as a teacher of all. architecture. But yeah. this is my most favorite. Yeah. Let me tell you. yeah. So so I I remember you saying the art and ar architecture was really the driver because history was your passion and it came from there. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to uh, to pick up on some of the things I saw in the presentations that I thought were enchanting, and I'm sure our audience thinks so too. Deepak, your your last supper, it it you know just talk a little bit about that because it really was uh, something that that immediately caught your attention. Thank you, Sheila. As I said, the last supper was visualized by me after a visit to central Italy in Umbria, in the region of Umbria. I'd gone to a small church over there and uh, it was a sort of a museum and church and they had a book laid out. I can't read Italian, so I don't know what it was, just a book or the Bible or something where Christ was done in the same miniature painting style of Europe, which we do in India. But uh, being blonde with blue eyes and all his apostles and they were richly robed as a papal or as a, uh, something where what the Pope would be wearing and all. So I asked our guide that this is interesting. How do you show Christ as a blonde with blue eyes and Magdalene, everybody was blue eyed, blonde and wearing rich robes because Christ never wore these uh, elaborate clothes. Right. <laughs> and, and forget being, he was a Jew, dark, yeah. olive colored, hook nose, certainly not blue eyes. He says, no, no, because to suit the Italian sensibilities, our artists used to make him exalted so that people would look up to Christ. And because he is the king of kings, so he had to be dressed up in all finery. So when I came back, I spoke to my artist in Kangra. I said, Bhai, I want you to do the Last Supper. And I showed him a picture of a Last Supper from the internet. I said, but you know, we are going to change certain things. First of all, he'll be Jewish, tending towards Indian side. Uh, well, Jews can be Indian, so that's not an issue. With dark hair, uh, darker skin, brown eyes or black eyes, set in a Kangra palace setting, but wearing simple, 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 very simple clothes. I don't want anything elaborate on it. The essence of Christ, which is simplicity and high thinking, even in a palace, I want it to stand out. And what did the artist say? I mean, what was his reaction? He, he said, this is rather alien. I mean, I'm used to painting figures of Maharajas and Mughals and Ranis all covered in elaborate clothes. The palace is elaborate. The peacock is elaborate. But the main subject you want simple. I said, yes, because Christ represented absolute simplicity and absolute high values. So there is no way that I'm going to deck him up in something which he doesn't represent. It's like putting Mahatma Gandhi in royal robes. I mean, I can't imagine that. And did you, did he then go on to do more of this kind of experimentation? No, 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 no. We work together. So normally I commission things with him, okay. which right. he paints. Okay. He's doing working exclusively with me. Okay. So Nita, what was fascinating about your work is the is the kind of cultural shifts, like going from you know the, the Buddhism of Bhutan to the to the Islam of Egypt to you know to the temples of Orissa. So how how do you do that? Because you're taking with you what you have, but it's not necessary that every place wants all of that. How do you sift through it? Uh, you know, I have always been research based. I I have an incomplete PhD after my master's in literature. I have an incomplete PhD on Christopher Marlowe. So one understands the tools of how you research. And I love to research. I have. So whenever I get very excited when I'm working in a new culture, because okay. it means that there's that much more traveling. There's that much more reading. There's that much more research to do. And I might use one thousandth of it. It is only incidental that I am an Indian. Yes. So my work, say in Cairo, has been Mamluk and Islamic. My work in in Upper Egypt has been, uh, you know, uh, has is pharaonic in nature. Uh, my work in, but I work with organic things, and in whichever country I work, I always make a directory of their crafts, and then I seek the best craftsmen. 
I like working with organic materials. I like working with natural materials. And I like working with master craftsmen in whichever country they are. That's so that's, that's been that's my approach. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, Smita, what I wanted to ask you from your presentation was, you know, you showed so clearly how the boundaries uh, just disappear, the political boundaries or the, or the boundaries that today everybody talks about. Like when you look at the, the temples that have, image that have vestiges of mosques in them or the mosques that have vestiges of temples in them. So how do you feel about the way there's this big movement to erase any current or just past history because it's not convenient? And th this erasure of history is such a big thing in getting rid of, in, in a sense of creating new boundaries of where they, they didn't exist. What, how do you react to that? Uh, 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 what what can one say? You know, uh, uh, one feels uh, sad that uh, uh, that there's such a political movement uh, should should exist in a, in, a, in a country like ours. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we we are a country. We are a subcontinent that is that is a mosaic of of so many subcultures. You know, it is it is a mosaic. And uh, no, it would it would it would be silly. You know, as as we were discussing the other yeah. day. Yeah. to uh, to kind of tie and kind of separate all the the pieces and then put them in in different boxes because that's not how we have been uh, uh, through uh, throughout our our history and that's not how we as as common people even live our lives or you know interact with each other uh, uh, you know I, I mean uh, i would like to have great faith in in, in the common people of our country uh, who are uh, who are not swayed? Uh, I hopefully by by no political uh, rhetoric and uh, uh, you know, crossing boundaries because just see you know we have to be able to see that uh, that identity uh, of of anyone you know any individual or or any community is is not is not a fixed sort of an entity a fixed sort of an entity it is made up of several overlapping uh, circles of identity. Each one of us is, is made up of so many different things. It is a combination of so many things, uh, so many different different cultures, even languages. You know, uh, you now we have a saying that every twelve villages, uh, uh, you know, the boli will will change. So you know, the uh, the languages meld into one another. The food habits meld into one another. Uh, cultures meld into one another. I would say that religious practices also. It is it is absolutely wrong to believe that that they are they are like these separate watertight compartments. They are not actually, and historically at least they were not. But you know, uh, later on, perhaps during the colonial times, these identities uh, were made to be more rigid. Uh, uh, historically, they were not. And speaking of architecture specifically, you know, uh, it it would be uh, it would be uh, rather. Uh, 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 not correct to uh, to kind of uh, to classify architecture uh, broadly on on religious terms because uh, because well building construction building elements architectural elements even architectural styles have got nothing to do with religion they have got to do with uh, with you know your local geographies materials uh, uh, construction and craft practices is a craftsman who uh, you know who are uh, who are the vehicles of uh, of uh, of ideas from from one subculture to to another culture. So you know if you if you look at uh, the, uh, uh, the the social uh, social aspect of architecture, uh, I uh, no one does not see clear cut boundaries. I think yeah. Deepak wants yeah. to say something here. Yes, Deepak, go ahead. I'd like to just add uh, what Smithaji has said that these changes have been taking place at least for the last 60, 70 years, if not before. First of all, the British built their barracks right in the middle of the Red Fort in New Delhi, where they did not belong, architecturally speaking, or even culturally speaking. Then after India became independent for many years, as I mentioned the other day, King George statue, it was pulled down from the pedestal because we wanted to sort of say that, no, we are not a colonial power. And all, yeah, and all that um, Swaraj movement 
then made us throw all those beautiful marble statues right into the dump yard called Coronation Ground in Delhi. So it is not a new phenomena. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it's certainly not new. It, it's just sad. Let's say I think I, I think stories need to stay. And what you're doing when you're erasing a memory or a story is you're creating a blank because something can't just come in there. It, they were living things. I agree with you there that you can't erase history by bringing down something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it has been done always, yes. always, always. The invaders destroyed buildings. The colonizers destroyed buildings. The previous people destroyed monuments or changed. The current ones are changing. It has been a continuous phenomena. Nothing new. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I would, what I would like to say is that uh, I think in today's time, I would I would want to see us to be better than uh, you know. Uh, we should evolve. Of the yeah. I, the, I hope humans evolve. Right here, we are facing a probable uh, war. So I don't know how far <laughs> evolution has come. I know. Yeah. The less said about it at the moment, the better. <laughs> correct, correct. <laughs> well, you know, Deepak, one of the things that uh, we that is fascinating <clears throat> is you work <throat> with uh, reviving so many skills, like you were talking about the Pashmina uh, carpets and uh, and you know the Kangra art, etc. So many skills that were kind of floundering or getting lost, and you're working so hard at reviving them, but at the same time, you're not doing it the way it always has been. So in a sense, it's not, you're not a purist looking for the same thing. Yet, yet you don't want to do something that is anything but the best way it can be done. So I think what one of the things I remember you saying is that it's the, it's the your belief is in one canvas for different strokes. <coughs> Absolutely. Please talk about that because that's, that, that's I think, really important. Thank you very much, Sheila. Uh, it is one canvas with different colors because whether I'm making pashmina carpets or silk carpets or trying to combine mugga silk or eri silk with fine wool or with pashmina, it is creativity in which I'm trying to create and recreate. Zari saris of uh, Banaras have always fascinated me. But historically, I could not find any evidence of Zari woven into shawls. They were always embroidered on shawls. And one of the main reasons is it's very difficult to weave hard Zari with Pashmina, which it cuts. But fortunately, with perseverance, I found the correct people who spent a lot of time trying to weave it. And now I'm trying to get trained, a younger generation, in weaving Pashmina carpets and Zari and uh, what do you call Pashmina shawls and Kani. So and that's the big thing to get new people into it to yes, believe it's worth doing. Yeah, absolutely. So I may, they will <coughs> definitely outlive me because these are older people teaching young boys of 25, 26. And uh, the people I work with in Srinagar, I've told them it's not just for me. I want this art to live. I want Pashmina carpets of Jahangir to continue. But the biggest problem is patronage because they are not cheap, as you can understand. If yeah. Jahangir was getting them made for himself, yeah. even that time they were not cheap. Yeah. So the thing is to find the right collector so I that this can carry on. Yeah, yeah. Sunita, uh, uh, I think one of the things that fascinates a lot of people who know about you and know about your work is the work you did in Delhi with Rashtrapati Bhavan. Uh, that that's not something you've actually uh, said much about, but it's just fascinating for everybody. Like, how does something that was uh, built at a certain time by a very eminent designer take on, and uh, you know, how does it evolve? Where you'd go in there, keep that spirit, but bring in your own. Uh, I would never say bring in my own because, as a conservator, okay. uh, whenever I've gone in for architectural or interior architectural conservation and restoration. Um, I have always tried to highlight the vision of the original architect. Um, and, and I've always said that, you know, when you design a hotel, you try and create something original. But when you're uh, doing conservation work, you hope that in two years time, uh, people will even forget that there was an intervention of a designer or an architect. To me, that is true conservation work. 
Well, I've been fortunate. I came in 82 when the Queen was visiting uh, for, uh, what was it, for the Commonwealth Conference. But then I just did a few state rooms. But my, but my, from 85 to 89, uh, you know, government had set up a, a very small committee of, uh, with, there was the late uh, Charles Korea and the late uh, Professor Mohammad Shahir and myself, and there was one person from uh, the PMO. And then out of that, I was selected to do uh, the, uh, the work because committees cannot design and produce drawings, etc. So as you all know, I, you know, it's well known uh, in India, of course, in Egypt, when I was working, they, they couldn't care one hoot if I had done Rashtrapati Bhavan or not. They were only interested in the hotels that I was designing for them. And one hotel would lead to another hotel. But yes, in uh, so I found that working as one delved into Lachians and what he had created, initially he had made some very derogatory remarks in 1912 uh, about Hindu and Muslim architecture. But when he actually started work on it, because, you know, there was the question of style, which the British had been striving towards for the last 200 years. And the then, the, the then, uh, the then Viceroy had wanted a Mughal style where, uh, of architecture, which, of course, Lachians did not agree on at all. But eventually what he created was an amalgamation based on Renaissance architecture, but taking much from Hindu and Muslim architecture. I mean, he took the deep chajjas. I, mean, I didn't show a visual of Rashtrapati Bhavan because it's so well known. The deep four feet eaves, the chhatris, the, you know, even the Delhi column using uh, temple bells, which he took from Buddhist and Hindu and Jain architecture. So there was all of that that happened. And then, of course, he was most impressed by uh, the gardens of the, so the Mughal gardens. But that is the only thing that he acknowledged that he took from India, you know, as an influence. But those were colonial times. But what he's created, to my mind, is unique. Yeah. Even the central vista and what he's, the way he's laid out the city is unique. We are one of the six garden cities in the world. And I think we should preserve it. I don't want to carry on more on that particular topic, but I kind of, I made my statement quite clear. You know, okay. we are speaking in a, in a thing about blurring boundaries. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Um, Smita, I told you that one of the things I was going to talk to you about is what I was fascinated by when you told me that your, your doctorate has been in the relationship between architecture and cinema. In this cinema crazy country, um, it's it's unimaginable that you could draw such a erudite and deep relationship with, with between these two completely divergent disciplines or thoughts. So please tell us a little about it. Yeah, sure. And uh, don't you think it is uh, you know it is actually uh, quite obvious that uh, uh, that cinema and architecture uh, should be related to each other. Of course, it's good because the, your, 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 it's a crime. Yeah, yeah. Every filmmaker, knowingly or unknowingly, uh, creates an architectural space. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when when they are filming something, because you cannot film anything in a in a, in, a, in a vacuum, mm -hmm. and therefore, uh, 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 and this is not something that is uh, you know, the relationship between architecture and cinema. Of course, a lot has been written and, and studied about, uh, particularly in in the West, but. Uh, uh, in terms of Indian cinema, uh, uh, this subject of cinematic architecture uh, has rarely been discussed. And uh, I thought of uh, doing that because, uh, you know, after, after so many years of, uh, of being an uh, architecture uh, teacher, if I wanted to do a PhD, I didn't want to do uh, in something which is like, you know, purely in architecture. I always... Uh, I, if I had to do it, I, I wanted to explore its relationship with, uh, with, with another art form or, or another media. And, and cinema uh, kind of presented itself. So, uh, uh, so one of the argument uh, uh, that I made uh, was that, that architecture uh, depicted in cinema is also to be considered architecture. 
you know uh, and uh, and therefore like can be a separate architecture is what you mean no as architecture so okay. architect uh, yeah it's another form of architecture form, yeah. so representation of architecture in in cinema uh, can also be viewed disciplinary yeah. disciplinarily you know using architectural vocabulary architectural theory etc and my specific focus was on uh, on representation of architecture of homes so you know filmic house uh, and i looked at that in hindi cinema uh, of all play, of all places and it was it was a very interesting journey uh, no no doubt uh, about it and uh, uh, what i uh, what i can say is that uh, it is it is definitely worth doing uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, architecture uh, uh, architectural thinking and uh, and it's, uh, it's it's appreciation as uh, as a uh, as a narrative form something that uh, that creates meanings would become actually uh, much more uh, clearer if you if you transcend the disciplinary boundaries and look at it in in, in other art forms uh, you know uh, so uh, it there is there is a great advantage of doing that uh, even architectural histories uh, you know uh, as as i could see from the result of my thesis the architectural histories you no know, uh, 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 even even histories of uh, uh, urban histories like cities like bombay uh and its its housing histories would would uh, would be enriched if if one also uh accepted cinema as a as a legitimate form of uh, of studying architecture so so yeah that is what uh, sila may uh, just add to what yeah. Uh, yeah. what uh, sure. what is being said you know that's a very interesting point about architecture and cinema what you made and the what you worked your thesis on and i will go one step further and say that even even tented cities are instant architecture and i hope somebody will really do a wonderful thesis because we have got such a legacy of it but much of it which is lost i mean it's one thing that the jodhpur tent was shown at the first festival of of india in at the met but everybody had tented cities so that's one thing secondly speaking about uh, uh, not uh, i'm not trying to say that i know amir khan the actor but we were both together in a um, in a seminar which was over 3 days in the states and it was the us and in uh, and india through each other's eyes so there were 20 indians 20 americans and i from the arts was I mean, where's Amir Khan? There was Amir Khan and me. Where's he and where's I? But that's a separate matter. And when we were having a deep discussion, and I said, you know, architecture is the mother of all the arts. He said, no, Sunita. Today it is cinema. So, uh, well, that's another way of of looking at things. <laughs> and 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 you know, Sanat Kada in Lucknow, they've done a wonderful. they did a wonderful sem- se- uh, seminar on lucknow as a protagonist in hindi cinema yeah so mm. true i mean you know uh, 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 cinema has has chronicled uh, cities architecture uh, you know historical as well as uh, absolutely uh, new ones yes. and even in, in set design uh, uh, there have been uh, there has been a lot of creativity a lot of architects are are naturally attracted to uh, uh, to media yeah. film making yeah. design production design uh, you know right from the beginning of cinema and and today i i believe it is much more you know with uh, with the virtual technologies coming into uh, into film making uh, i think a lot of uh, architects uh, after graduating are going into media and uh, uh, and 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 uh, and, and film uh, production design so so certainly yes well um one of the the things we grapple with today is that we we is the concept of globalization on the one side that gives you so much but localization that you want to want to keep and your own identity so while contemporary conversation is dominated with by issues like technology the digital world sustainability globalization in a sense these all work at blurring boundaries yet i know that each of you like each true artist believes that a boundary is not the same as homogeneity in a uniform world 
it's as we go global we w- still want to celebrate local as we get technology to help in so many ways including webinars at covid time we still strive to create a unique identity and as we strive for a world that renews itself in sustainable ways we still look for stories that need to be told and explorations that are essential so before we take questions i just want to quickly ask each of you mm-hmm. to if you want to give us one symbol or, or or something a metaphor an emblem or whatever that exemplifies what your practice your work your belief has been uh, something like the the anar or the uh, i mean the the mango that became the paste or whatever if there's something that that is that you hold dear to you that has been the symbol of all the boundaries that you have blurred whether it's something you're teaching something you're making something you think deepak we'll start with you well you said it before i could say it it is the paisley okay because the paisley <laughs> whether it's my shawls or my carpets or anything that symbolizes a complete blurring of boundaries and it makes me feel a little proud that from the ambi the carry it went all across the world to the west how it evolved into badam and then to bote and then the different forms of this basic ambi or arm which we know so well in india lovely so you're the paisley man Absolutely. what about you sunita it's sunita smita no sunita you asking me yeah, yeah go ahead sunita yeah okay you know uh, mine is a thought which i think is integral to uh to my design philosophy and which is i believe in syncretic culture so i'm showing this uh, this uh, jami masjid in champaner champaner pavagarh which is as you all know is a world heritage site it was the first uh, capital of gujarat and why i chose this is because in the prayer hall in the coffers are thousand lotuses that have been carved by hindu craftsmen for an islamic mosque to me that is india and that is what that syncretic culture is what informs my work okay thank you 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 have a picture you want to show us right uh, you didn't no. see the the picture didn't come on sorry yeah thank you yeah she she showed right yeah. thank uh, you swetha yeah. uh yeah so uh, you know uh, both deepak and sunita uh, showed uh, uh, showed a symbol uh, i mean an, an example i would like to uh, actually say something something here about about the discipline of architecture itself you know uh, uh, in in the context of uh, this idea of globalization and and local uh, cultures and today uh, you know uh, uh one uh, one very hopeful thing about about the young uh, professionals uh, in india is that is that they have kind of gone beyond uh, you know uh, these uh, these arguments about about modernism post modernism this style that style and they are they are actually more willing to actually uh, look at uh, uh, look at solving the the, the problems on the, on the ground and in order to do that uh, they are uh, they would embrace you know ideas ideas from from across the world from across the disciplines in fact today a lot of ideas uh, uh, come not necessarily from architecture but from uh, from other disciplines uh, uh, from from other forms of knowledges and they have been embraced uh, by the young professionals and i think one one can be really hopeful among uh, you know among all the mediocrity that that one sees all around us uh, that, that there are there are quite a lot of uh, young people uh, young students and young professionals who are who are literally uh, you know uh, blurring the boundaries uh, at one hand but at the same time are very rooted in the, in the in the problems that that they are seeking to solve so that is what i would like to say in the end that's really hopeful and fantastic to hear uh, thank you all but we are now going to take a whole bunch of questions we'll take as many as we can uh, the first one is uh, it's to all and it's from uh, sasha gonzalez and she's asked have you ever had a problem in showing your vision or portraying it if yes what do you do would you like to answer that uh, sunita Have you ever had a problem in showing your vision or portraying it? And if yes, what did you do? I have 
in a career of which next year will be 50 years, I have to say that not once, and that's a big thing, not once has one, has one presented something because I have already sifted through and done so much homework and done so much research that, uh, that to my mind, I'm presenting the best for that particular project. And when I say project, because I've spent a lifetime doing hotels and public buildings uh, for the first 30 years and then moved to more to residences and other things. There is a reason for that because I always say it was before the fall and a fall because I broke my neck, but not a fall from grace. So where I stopped doing, um, you know, start, stop traveling abroad 10 times a year. One has never faced that problem. And I think that is because uh, we all uh, came so, I mean, people like me, I mean, we were so prepared for what? I mean, we really understood a brief because hotels cost, I mean, millions of dollars. Public projects also have to do with lakhs and lakhs of rupees. And where there's a sort of stringency which need not be necessary in a residence. So one has to be so careful with public money, how one is spending it and what is the vision that is being created. Because most of these, of these hotels or these, uh, say, like the parliament building in Bhutan, they have to be representative of their own culture. So it... Uh, so when one and incidentally, Bhutan was the most difficult project that I ever researched. I'm talking about 88, 89. It was a closed country. People did not even couldn't get a uh, foreigner certainly couldn't get visas to get in uh, barring 2000 at that time. And there was there were no books on it. So uh, but there was no Internet. But I did the research by traveling the length and breadth of that country. Zong after Zong after Zong. Okay. So I have not had it. I'm fortunate. And, uh, and uh, I how hope you that's fantastic. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. And, uh, and, you know, to, to say what, uh, what uh, Smita was saying, I hope we never become a homogeneous society yeah. because we are not. Yeah. And, you know, and one must take pride in one's own culture and, and from place to place. I mean, things differ so much. Yeah. And so there's so much culture that is being offered in terms of, uh, you know, uh, tangible objects and buildings and, and represent those in however modern a form. And uh, I think that is the challenge that young people of today have really taken on brilliantly. Is there something either of you would like to add or should I go on to another question? Uh I, I, I would like to say something about uh, about architectural pedagogy, you know, things that I do as a teacher of architecture. I think one of the uh, challenge uh, is uh, is that uh, architecture pedagogy is, is kind of divided into into several uh, compartments. Uh, that is uh, that is due to practicality or uh, or a matter of convenience that you know you have to uh, you have to kind of uh, uh, you know form your teaching into into different different packets called called subjects and all that and uh, in all that uh, sometimes the link between all of that is is kind of lost so what i try to do is i keep uh, my my uh, my one one foot although i may have only two but i think i have several in in all the different uh, sort of compartments so i teach design i teach construction and technology and i also teach uh, humanities and uh, what i sometimes end up doing is uh, in construction class, I talk about history, and in history class, I talk about construction. And uh, I feel that uh, that is one way of uh, kind of overriding this uh, this this problem. Uh, at least, you know, in communicating to the students that, that these are not uh, separate things, but they, they all not compartmentalized. Kind of yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for question me, for uh, you, Deepak. Sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to make a brief statement. Please. As I've always worked for myself and I'm not answerable to anyone. So I've always had a blank canvas in whichever material field I'm doing. And uh, so there has no, been no problem in saying what I'm trying to represent. 
Very lucky man you are, Deepak. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a question from Yashaswini Iyer that is to you. How and what made you realize the form of art you're comfortable in to express your interpretations with facts or nature? Well, being a botanist and a naturalist, it was easy for me to, you know, sort of put them in carpets or shawls or even in miniature paintings. One of the Kangra miniature paintings we have done, I got commissioned, was uh, Lakshman Rekha for Sita and Ram going and hunting Marit. And Ravan is hiding in the bushes as Ravan. So that was a take on the mythology. But all the plants, all the birds, all the animals depicted in that painting are the ones which we find in Kangra. So nothing uh, sort of fantasy over there. The, you can actually be in Kangra and see those very plants and birds. That's the advantage of being a naturalist and an artist. Lovely. <laughs> Question for Smita. Uh, an anonymous, I don't have a name. How important is it to talk about cultural shifts and yet share the magnificence of the past? How do you keep the heritage and history relevant? Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would say that uh, heritage and, and history uh, kind of it, it surrounds us. You know, we, we, we talked about the idea of memory, you know, earlier. Uh, uh, in, in our uh, deliberations and uh, you know uh, uh, if we uh, uh, the relevance of history is is if you if we value our our memories and you know what happens like uh, have you ever talked to a person who uh, who has uh, been afflicted with amnesia who has lost all his or her memories uh, you know it uh, if we do uh, something like that to our cities or or to uh, or to our our, our habitats, that like it would be like talking to uh, a person who, uh, uh, who is suffering from from amnesia, uh, and uh, so that that is one thing. And and second thing is that uh, 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 that uh, you know, like you know, uh, just you know, to repeat that well known adage that you know, uh, if you uh, if you ignore history, you will you will repeat uh, its its mistakes. So. Uh, so one, 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 should, one should therefore value it, one should learn from it, and one should uh, contemporize it uh, uh, you know, to, to go forward uh, in, uh, in, in whatever that one is doing. Thank you. Uh, a question for Sunita from Ruam. Mm -hmm. Any special memory while working with master craftspeople? Was it difficult in terms of explaining the work? And how did they manage to keep to deadlines? If you could please speak a little bit about the process. Uh, you know, when I, I've spent my professional life working with master craftsmen, but I must say that uh, I have a three-part uh, sort of, uh, I have a three-part business. One is design and one is architecture. And then since my daughter has come into it, it's architecture and everything else that is included with architecture, structure, and construction. Uh, and I've been making furniture for 50 years, which I very briefly showed. And we only have worked with uh, master craftsmen. So I am very used to working with people who always work with their hands. And one of the things is, and then, so I think one, and I learned how to be, uh, how to restore furniture whilst studying literature, just as an interest, little realizing that one day it would become my profession, uh, making furniture. And I'm proud to say that uh, I think we make, we are known to make very fine quality furniture. Uh, so having said that, it was, it was uh, a very easy way of working with stonemasons and I mean, even their brilliant Raj Mistries who, who could teach many architects structure and the ways of building. Wouldn't you agree, Smita? And I think that these are what Japan calls their uh, uh, national treasures. And we have so many. I worked with master weavers. In fact, in Rashtrapati Bhavan, one of the things I did was that if it was if, if I was getting uh, bronzes made or cast rather, uh, I was getting them done in Swami Malai 
by people who have won the President's Award because I think new crafts are also amazing and new craftsmen who are working in the old tradition are also amazing. Uh, what I do not what I do not like, I am a bit of a purist. What I do not like is trying to teach a man who has worked in something for 500 years how to do it better. Because you have, one has to really be very careful if that is the conversation you're going to be having with a master craftsman or a master weaver. You know, you can innovate, you can design but be very sure it's going to be better than that. So otherwise, don't get him, you know, mixed up. Because like a lota, I mean, nobody can improve on the form of a lota. As Charles Ames said, it's the most perfect form. So and that took generations to develop a simple, basic lota. Okay, the last question is a, is a general question and I'm going to read this only because I think it's, it's very relevant. It's from Ayush Pathania and he says, is there a way in which all of you eminent people can introduce art and architecture as a part of school curriculums so that children can imbibe the value of syncretic cultures and how art can shape our thinking? Deepak, what can you do to do that? <laughs> Well, I would love to give How can we influence this? Yeah. Well, I would love to give lectures in schools, if invited, or in colleges, and telling people how beautiful our arts are and how important it is for the growth of our souls. So great. You've got Deepak volunteering here. So anybody who wants to get them on, please do. If you've got anything to add, Smita, I know Asad wants to come in. So just you've got 15 seconds. Oh, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a very, very uh, valid suggestion. And you know, uh, Currently, there is, there is a rage of teaching 